Um, you're all very welcome to our uh, webinar this evening. Um, I'm delighted on behalf of the Moore Institution and Centre for Irish Studies at NUI Galway um, to welcome our uh, guests this evening from uh, right across Ireland and also for those of you that are streaming in as well from uh, many different corners of the world as well. You're all very, very welcome. Um, it's our pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Karen Till uh, back with us again uh, virtually. Unfortunately, we're not here in person, um, but also our many other colleagues from Maynooth University and further afield as well um, as part of the Dublin Art Book Fair and to launch um, this wonderful volume, Earth Writings, Bogs, Forests, Fields and Gardens uh, with us today. So I'll pass it over to Karen now. She'll introduce the volume a little bit more um, and we'll get the proceedings going then with everybody. So over to you, Karen. Great. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you very much, Nessa, and a special thank you to the fabulous Moore Institute for hosting our launch. Welcome, everyone, to the launch of Earth Writings, Bogs, Forests, Fields, and Gardens. This evening's events launches not only this book, which in happier times you might have been able to hold in your hands, so I will show you in my little um, screen uh, here. And um, hopefully you can see that. And I am told uh, that we're already sold out at the Temple Bar Art, Art Gallery, but do not dismay. We will get more books there to them and they'll be available soon for you to order through the Dublin Art Book Fair later this week. And you can also pick up a book at Charlie Burns Bookstore in Galway. Our book launch also um, is launching our um, book, as I mentioned here, but also our web page and our new project. The web page is earthwritings.ie and this inaugurates a series of publications which will come out starting next year with Cork University Press under the, the same banner for a series called Earth Writings. The collective project uh, will be a book series edited by Nessa Cronin at um, NUI Galway at the School of Geography, Archaeology, and Irish Studies, and Jerry Kearns and myself at Maynooth University. Now, Earth Writings, of course, is the etymological root of geography, geo, earth, graphy, writing. And so from geography and learning from artists, we began the project by inviting pairs of artists and scholars to reflect upon issues of common concern related to our current earth crises. The project began before COVID. And so at the moment we were trying to figure out ways to um, invite the general public, invite artists and scholars and community leaders to begin thinking about what we can do together in solidarity with humans and other species to start to um, recognize these crises and also to live differently and to repair our collapsing environments. And from that common concern, we then uh, work together on a series of seminars. And then also um, this resulted in an exhibition last year at Maynooth University Library, a one day symposium in, in the geography department at the Maynooth. And um, what you can do is go to our earthwritings.ie webpage because some of the conversations that we did have last year are now available there as podcasts. Um, so you just would have to go to the main page and click under podcasts. And you can see that we began then uh, through the exhibition, through the seminar and following after this, a series of exchanges, walks, uh, exhibitions and other activities. And so the current volume builds upon those exchanges. It also presents some of the artwork exhibited and the academics and artists in the volume are reflecting upon creative practices that are embedded um, eco-social uh, practices as well as research activities. So um, we can see then um, the table of contents here. And at the outset, we would like to thank very much our friends and supporters that made this project possible, including an Irish Research Council New Foundation STEAM Award, the Maynooth University Geography Department's Research Incentive Fund, 
Creative Ireland and Creative Kildare, uh, working together with the Kildare County Council Art Service and Cork University Press. I also want to especially thank Orla Goodwin at the Dublin um, Art Book Fair for inviting us to be part of the book fair and also inviting us to launch with you the book today. Uh, the Moore Institute, in particular David Kelly, who's really been fabulous in helping us uh, with AD and other support. This is also an extension of GEO Week, an international um, week in which the Geographical Society of Ireland is supporting us. And I also would especially like to thank very much Padraig at Pure Designs, who did a fabulous uh, a job of designing and laying out the book itself. So um, what I want to do now is uh, mention just the format and, and then we'll get going with the short presentations. So each pairing of the artist and academic will briefly introduce their essay and conversation. And um, all of the contributors, all of the contributing artists, academics, and um, curators and art service officers are here online with us tonight. So we have a full program and we're delighted that everybody can be here with us. Um, after the pairing uh, contributions that we have of artists and scholars, Lucina Russell, who's the arts officer for Kildare County Art Service, uh, who launched the exhibition last year, um, wrote a lovely introduction to the volume, and so she'll be wrapping up our paired conversations. And after that, we'll have some time for comments and reflections and question and, and uh, answer from the audience. So any observations or questions you'd like to raise, please submit those to the question and answer button, uh, the chat line, and Nessa or I will read that and raise it at the end of our presentations. Also, before we get started, I would like to welcome, like Nessa did, our audience guests from all across the world, uh, all around the island of Ireland, also from Germany, New Zealand, the United States, and the United Kingdom. And we're so excited to have members of different collaboratives and networks, the Space and Place Research Collaborative, Almost Acha, Mapping Spectral Traces, the Just City Reading Collective, and many others. You're all very welcome. So again, I have asked each artist and academic pairing to introduce their conversation or essay in the book by addressing three themes. And those themes were inspired by the feminist theorist Donna Haraway, whose lovely quote sits here um, on the slide and encapsulates the three themes. First, why this place? What is the importance of this particular Irish environment in which the artist practices and is embedded? And how does she try to rebuild more healthy places together with others? Second, um, how do you understand Donna Haraway's idea of stay, staying with the trouble? And here's her fabulous book by that title. Um, what does it mean to make trouble, to quote, stir up potent responses to devastating events while also settling troubled waters through the artists and academics creative and research practices? And third, again, referring to Haraway, how can we, quote, uh, make kin in lines of inventive connection so that we can learn to live and die well with each other in a thick present? So I am going to now swap hats. I am moving now from being an editor and curator to being um, one of the participants. And so I'd like to invite uh, my friend and co-author and collaborator, Shadina Sullivan, to turn on her video as well. And um, I will start by introducing the first essay, which actually is the fourth essay in the volume. So um, Shadine and I began our, our conversations with, ex we're exploring gardens, urban gardens. And particularly in those kind of settings, those are, gardens are historically associated as controlled nature and particularly to benefit the upper class. So how can cities become places with healthy, inclusive environments, places of abundance and multi-species well-being, especially now in this difficult time that we're facing with earth health and political crises? Well, we can make places such as community gardens and orchards as what Ifu Tuan calls fields of care. Shadine and I understand such fields according to feminist ecologies of community 
and commons. And for Silvia Federici, as well as other indigenous scholars and activists, creating feminist commons entails struggle and hard work. But the result might teach us humans the importance of community, of, of multi-species well-being, of solidarity and awakening, including to relations of social and ecological repair and regeneration. Shadeen explained to me the importance of creating green commons in the city of Dublin. People can access free food. They can learn by staying connected to seasonal cycles. They can relax and meet. And moreover, in Ireland, imagining cities as delicious, a lovely phrase that she uh, mentioned, and reclaiming land for trees as active agents, that those are political acts in, in, in Ireland, and also something that some of our other uh, artists will mention later. Now, feminist fields of care also offer human and non-human residents the fruits of shared labor and becoming with, becoming with pollinators, plants, soil, fungi, birds, and other wildlife, because they also have a place here in this green commons. I'm now going to turn it over to Shadeen, who's going to speak about her ongoing and still unfolding collaborative project in Dublin 8, and that's called Hard Graph. And it's during a time of extreme housing crisis when city authorities who are offering gentrification instead of social housing well, in this context, a small group of people have begun to make food forests and urban orchards. orchards. Shadeen? Thanks so much, Karen, and thank you, Manuth Geography, for inviting me to collaborate um, on this amazing Earth Writings project. Um, it was wonderful to think with Karen towards this um, timely um, publication and also to think with um, all the other artists and um, academics. Um, so the project that myself and Karen um, describe in the book, as she mentions, is called Hard Graft. And um, it's an object that I initiated three years ago and it was supported by an arts organization, Common Ground, um, through their Citizen Artist Award. Um, Hard Graft connects to the current moment with the climate crisis, species extinction, and rise of right-wing politics, it feels like um, hard work, doesn't it? Um, so this kind of idea of staying with the trouble, the project responds by connecting people and collectively working and planting towards community orchards. The project consisted of a number of grafting workshops, and this was led by an expert grafter Kevin Kenny, who maintained and cared for the UCD Rosemount Research Station's heritage orchards. Um, grafting as a skill is not something that many people um, practice. Um, my father um, remembers his grandfather grafting a fruit tree in their garden as a child. But even in my three years of working with community gardens, I hadn't actually um, grafted anything before. So the Hard Graft Project brought this lost knowledge back to community. Um, grafting as a word, the idea, um, metaphor and action attracted me. As you see in this image here of this, this woman um, is grafting here. So what it, graft means to work. It speaks to ideas of labor. But another meaning of grafting is used during the reproduction of, of fruit trees. In order to reproduce the same type of fruit, example, if you wanted to re reproduce a heritage tree like the Ballyvaughan seedling, um, you need to cut a branch or skion from a tree very early in spring and um, before it buds and then attach it to a rootstock. So we collectively grafted um, a number of trees from the heritage fruit trees and ended up with tree nurseries, which we kept in Fatima Community Garden um, in Rialto and also in Richmond Barracks, which is in Inchicore. Last November, we planted out the five orchards from the grafted fruit trees. Through hard graft, a new network of people learned to work together. Um, we learned how to graft, plant orchards together, all of which contributed to the labors of repairing and reimagining the city. Reclaiming these new and old community spaces for trees and Taskscapes um, asserts residents' rights to their imagined common city. 
So um, thanks, Karen, and I hope you all enjoy um, this wonderful um, publication that we've um, brought together. Thanks so much, Shadeen. Um, I'd like to now invite the next pairing, Kathy Fitzgerald and Nessa Cronin, to please turn on their videos and introduce their conversation. Great. Thank you, Karen and Shodeen. Um, and I think lots of those themes that you've been speaking to um, are going to kind of resonate, I think, with the, the other pairings as well. Um, I just had a few texts from people there as well who are watching this from different parts of the world and they like the idea of a pairing. I think I think you have more food and wine at the moment, so I think we can all celebrate with that later on as well this evening. Um, but to move very quickly on to our, our pairing, uh, I had the pleasure and um, privilege of working again with Cathy Fitzgerald. Um, and uh, Cathy, I'll just move straight into the, the kind of the first question that um, that we had kind of proposed as, as a way of thinking um, for this. So why this place? So I might ask you to say something about why forests for you, what brought you to forests and also why are forests important uh, for you personally, but also then for the planet as well. Okay, thanks so much, Nessa and, and Karen and Jerry for this amazing project. Um, well, I live in a small woodland. Uh, it's a monoculture turning into a permanent forest. So it really has been a place where I can test out new ideas. And if we repair our relations with forests, the most complex living community on the planet, we'll solve most of the problems of the ecological emergency. Forests are great for increasing our understanding of the ecological imperative. From forests, we can learn lots about ecological interdependency how we rely on diverse species thriving together for all well-being. For example, forest ecologists confirm how in healthy forests, fungi help nutrients travel between tree species. For creative practice to be relevant um, to these urgent times as well, an ecological framing is crucial. We have to communicate that the ecological catastrophe is a problem of the dominant culture with ancient historical roots. Looking at the present system of industrial forestry helps me understand how enormous this cultural shift has to be. I became eco-literate from relating better to the small forest I live with. Employing sustainable forestry practices, learning about eco-ethics and philosophy gives me agency to articulate progressive ecological forest policy and advocate for international ecocide law. And as Shodeen and uh, Karen have said as well, moving to an ecological paradigm is hard, slow work. And it can keep you awake at night knowing we have to overcome many habits of human privilege in just a few years. However, as moral beings, giving up is not an option as the late Kenyan tree planting Nobel Peace Prize winner Wangari Mathai reminded us. So thanks very much there. I'll uh, let you have to speak a few words as well, Nessa. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Amelia and Kathy. Um, so we're kind of going to move into the, the second set of questions um, that we were kind of thinking uh, through and with uh, this evening, um, and in particular the Donna Haraway quote of staying with the trouble and what does that actually mean? Um, and Karen, I think, said, or it was a show, Dean, is, I said as well at the, at the beginning, one of the questions is, you know, what does it mean to make to be to, to make trouble in many ways? And I think as artists and, and for those that are academics, one could argue actually that's our job. Our job is to make trouble. Um, our job is actually to question the received norms and to hopefully uh, recreate something that might be uh, in some way possibly better um, in the future as well. So there's three very um, short points that I'd like to make um, in terms of that question of staying with the trouble, why should we, how can we? Um, so the first is uh, to pick up and to, uh, to echo what Shodeen said, um, is that staying with the trouble is hard. Like this is, and Cathy has said this as well, this is hard work. Um, and Shodeen's project of hard graft, I think is a fantastic uh, term and a fantastic way of thinking through um, all of those kinds of things. Um, in, in particular, transdisciplinary work is hard, working across the different um, in interstices of art, academia and activism for some people as well. It's hard, it's tiring, it's wearing, but it's also very, very rewarding as well too. 
Um, the second point I'd like to make is a point actually about hope. So we have the, the hard part and now we have the hope part. Um, and I specifically wore a yellow dress this evening because apparently yellow is a very good colour for hope. Um, and I think we really need some of that right now as we're now entering the darkest part of, uh, of the year in many ways. Um, but one thing I think we can learn from with the COVID-19 global um, pandemic as well is that how the world itself can turn, it can pivot and it can change pretty damn quickly when it needs to, when it wants to. Um, and that actually things and system change can happen very quickly if the political will is there. Um, and I think that's actually a very hopeful uh, thing to think about. Um, We've just come out of the back of Science Week as well. We're now in Geo Week. And one of the themes of Science Week in Ireland with uh, Science Foundation Ireland and the Irish Research Council was this idea of that we can choose our futures. Um, we have that choice, we have that power. Maybe we need to take it back a little bit more, um, but we can choose our future. And that's a really, really important thing to remind all generations of that as well. Um, the extra point then uh, about the global pandemic as well is to remind us of the role of public scholarship um, and at the moment of course we're all we're all epidemiologists uh, just as, as much as we were all economists 10 and 12 years ago but I think that the, the role of public scholarship and also the appetite and the ability of the general public to understand and to engage with um, very difficult questions and very difficult very difficult kinds of scenarios and make their own decisions on that, I think is also very, very powerful as well. Um, the last point I'll make is um, a point that I have uh, become very interested in is the idea of future studies as well and where all of this can take us in different ways. And I'm thinking of the, um, the, the academic Kerry Facer who talks about the importance of storytelling in troubled times and the importance of narrative. So whether it's the narrative we have today, a narrative on Zoom, whether it's a narrative in a book, and it's so nice to have something material that we can touch and feel and appreciate, um, or a visual narrative, or a music narrative, or a dancing narrative. But all of these narratives are really, really important in helping us stay with the trouble, but also um, to to kind of to rearrest, I think, the, the power and the control of our futures as well. Um, so that's the kind of general points I'd like to make there. Um, and I'll go back to, to Kathy now just about a final question about collaboration and how and why collaboration is important. Um, so Kathy, just a few words maybe on collaborative practice or why you think collaboration is important. Great, thank you, um, Nessa. Um, that has been a key feature in, in my work for the last uh, decade. And I think in this time of great turning towards the life-sustaining culture, as eco-philosopher Joanna Macy writes, it is really complex and overwhelming, and I'm hopeful on some days and I'm pessimistic on others. And where do we begin? Well, for starters, we can't figure all of this change out on our own. A life-sustaining worldview, what, who, which some people call the symbiocene, demands holistic knowing to live well with the wider community of life. It's beyond urgent that we adopt integrated eco-social values, practices, and policy. Fostering regenerative culture, whether we are in the creative sector, education, business, politics, faith traditions, or forestry, is a community endeavor that benefits all. And I'm happy to share that working, learning, and practicing together is motivating, nourishing, and lots of fun. Thank you so much, Nessa. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Nessa and Kathy. And I'd like to ask um, uh, Jerry Kearns and Pauline O'Connell to turn on their videos and microphones, please, and invite them to talk about their pairing and conversation. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Karen, and to everyone involved. It's been a very uh, enriched um, experience. But I'll just explain briefly my journey to here and, and working on my doorstep, as it were. I moved to rural County Kilkenny in the southeast of Ireland in 2003 to an upland area seven miles from Kilkenny City, where I grew up, to a place 900 feet above sea level and 200 feet above the local snow line. As a counter-urban migrant leaving the capital city during the Celtic Tiger years, the rhetoric at the time was to sell up in Dublin, make an economic killing and move to the countryside for a slower pace and a better quality of life. The, its physical attributes offered a unity with nature, fresh air, scenic views and moral attributes offered conviviality, sociability and local democracy. It seems that the rural then offered an escape from modernity 
that which is bound up with capitalist globalization. While my image landscape was informed by art history, however flawed, my interdisciplinary practice was rooted in visual art. My rural relations were framed by what Felix Guattari calls ecosophy, where the environment, social relations and human subjectivity coalesce. But soon after moving here, I realized that where I live was not on the electoral map. While difficult to articulate, I felt a certain lack of social cohesion, where subtle intra-rural rivalries were delineated by invisible boundaries, all present through their absence. I was looking for a way to creatively articulate these differences, similarities, dependencies and oppositions, and tug of war as a rural pastime became a visual metaphor for community to be played out. And so I needed a field, a place where new rural, rural vocabularies and subjectivities could emerge. These vo vocabularies, which did not further reinscribe the same politics of narrative that previously prevailed. This place is a place of negotiation, a performance, and it became the community field, which I co-founded in 2013. It's a publicly owned two and a half acre field. It's near a village of Castle Warren in northeast County Kilkenny. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to just reflect a little upon uh, what I learned from Pauline's practice as a way of living with the troubles. So living in the wake of ecological and climate crises requires not only scientific, but also ethical and creative wisdom. As other citizens, artists like Pauline O'Connell learn about their place in a web of life and like others must decide what to do about it. But responding as this sort of artist incites a quality of attentiveness that turns observation into care, rather than, as with scientists, findings into policy. Pauline is an artist who also writes engagingly and incisively about her own practice and understands it as taking up philosophical issues about making a home amidst humans and other living forms as raised, for example, by Heidegger, whom she quotes in her work and in her exhibitions. But Pauline also reflects upon sociological questions such as the nature of community in a post-agricultural rural society. In these respects, Pauline, making a home for herself and her family, develops an artistic practice through which I learned to notice, for example, how important hedges might be to the countryside as home for animals and birds as record in their various dimensions of the political geography of barony and parish, and of the attack on communalism that came through enclosure. But I also attend to them as sturdy scaffolding for division, such that a person might sit on a fence, but hardly on a hedge. I enjoy the invitation to reflect on how the privatized space of a field may also serve rather like a bowl to contain what might otherwise run into sand, the sociability of agonistic association with neighbors, the ironic and friendly affiliation with one pub against the folk of another. And a reminder that in certain sorts of contention, there may yet be the respect of shared effort, common skill, purposeful endeavor for relatively trivial ends. It's a tug of war after all, and not a war. With fields and hedges and the invitation to community that artistic imagination can elaborate from them, we might attend caringly to the new ways we may live in spaces that no longer serve primarily as the supports of a capitalist food economy. There are other things to be done within this web of life. And I'd now like to pass back to Pauline to reflect upon the collaborative nature of some of these doings. Thanks, Jerry. In this slide here, you can see an event that was held on the 9th of December 2012. It was the Heave Ho Pub Pulling League final, where three local pubs comprised of eight men, two subs, one coach, each took turns pulling for their side. Attended by approximately 350 people in the community field, intra-rural allegiances and rivalries were played out, made visible and audible. Afterwards, many people made inquiries about future events. So my sense of lack of social cohesion was definitely e extended beyond me, as it were. Since then, I've worked in collaboration with the trustees of the field to co-found the Castle Warren Cultural Development Group. The purpose of the field 
has shifted from solely sport orientated to one that's used for social, cultural and education purposes. The field acts as a conduit for community. It is a place where the old rural as myth and the new rural or post rural as multiple fragmented and contradictory meet where human nature relations are tested. And I think to end on this slide here, it's, it's a balancing act. And as Jerry quoted in, in the essay, are we hedging in or hedging out? And I think that that's a, a nice way to end it. We're trying to find a position ultimately. Thanks very much, Jerry. Thank you, Thank you Pauline and Jerry, um, fabulous. And I'd like to uh, now invite our final academic and artist pairing, Monica DeBath and uh, Patrick Bresnahan to turn on their uh, video screens and microphones and they will have the final pair conversation after which we'll invite Lucina Russell to wrap up. Hello everybody, um, my name is Monica and um, my arts practice is called Plot Kafak and I just would like to thank everybody here for making this possible and particularly um, uh, Lucina for um, dealing with the trouble of keeping artists alive over many, many years. Um, so my practice is called um, um, Plot Kafak and Plot kapok means a small holding. It has that sense of holding something, taking care of it. And traditionally, a person's plot is where and what they would have lived from. This plot moved away from the domestic. Bordna Mona provided me with a disused room at a local industrial peat excavation site just up the road from where I live. This has served as my studio for over 10 years, a place to work, and most importantly, a space for conversations. My work thinks about the future of this place after the peat industry has gone. What can be done about the material remnants of an entire industry? How can the land and communities that have been made and broken through industrial peat extraction be healed? Informed by research with local expertise, I made a series of miniature paintings to reimagine and open up conversations about the future of these mined peatlands. Sphagnum moss, which you see on this slide here, the bog builder, is depicted in some paintings as uncanny, supernatural and monstrous, outflanking industrial infrastructures and buildings. This has the effect of turning a relatively brief industrial history into something minor but compared to the deep time of sphagnum. What happens, as Patrick has questioned, if you consider the bog through plant history rather than Bordnamona history? What happens if you consider the future through the slow mend of the sphagnum and the raised bog remnant in which it survives? Now I call on Paddy. Thanks, Monica. Um, good to see you at a distance and thank you to um, Karen and, and um, Lucina for, for putting all this together. And I had the great pleasure of, of being in conversation with Monica and getting to know her work a bit better. Um, and I think as she uh, has spoken there, um, you get a sense both of the kind of, um, I guess the inspiring quality of, of her work, but also um, how it deals directly with this question of staying with the trouble. I think Jerry used the, the phrase of, of what happens, you know, when we're living in the wake of, of climate um, change and climate crisis and biodiversity crisis. And specifically, the, Monica's work is, is thinking about living in the, the wake of this um, industrial uh, uh, peat excavation and peat burning. And this, this industry, um, which is more than an industry because it's produced these landscapes, these residues, as, as Monica mentioned, but also these infrastructures and, and a form of life, really, which was co connected with a, a, a kind of secure wage labor, with the kinds of infrastructures of the good life, you know, people living in the Midlands, these towns that were built around this industry. And the very difficult questions then of what happens after that, um, you know, both socially, but also ecologically. So I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit here because um, there's something, you know, interesting about how Monica's work, the, the, the art that she produces, but also her practice are so closely cleaved together. So the fact that the plot, the studio that Monica uses to work in, 
is inside an, an old industrial building. So it's, it's trying to do something new within the, the shell of, of the old, you know, it, it gets so directly at it. So I'm just going to read something. The plot is an opening to confront troubling questions. The making of different futures in the Midlands or anywhere most likely requires relinquishing existing attachments. Monica's work tries to broach this discomfort with those most affected. A commitment to the workers and their communities, a commitment to the bog ecologies, also affected by the outworkings of peat mining. What can emerge in such damaged landscapes beyond the call of industrial promise and ruin? Um, and, and in that space, one of the, the figures or the, 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 you know, the, the, the forms of life that Monica was most drawn to, and she'd already mentioned it was the sphagnum moss. And in this painting here, you see this, this uncanny, this sort of, this, this, this huge uh, uh, plant, which in, re in reality is actually very small, far, uh, uh, you know, bigger than the, the buildings in the background. And there's something about that juxtaposition, which I think really opens up this different, you know, uh, imaginary of the, of the future. So I'll pass that back to Monica to maybe talk a little bit more about her collaborations. Okay, so in terms of my collaborations, I, I'm a founder member of a, a group of interdisciplinary people, um, and we call the group Creator Rathang and Mehel. And Mehel is the Irish word for a coming together of people to help each other out in terms of harvesting is what its traditional use was. Um, so here you see the harvest of the peat, and you see two very young children um, looking at a, a massive big pile or mountain of milled peat, and on their left, you'll see a line of trees. And that's where there is this amazing remnant of um, sphagnum, reasonably sphagnum rich, rich bog, even though it's obviously very delicate because so much water which it needs has actually put, been drained away from it. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. And we're, we also have seminars um, and a number of them coming up and which will, which will explore areas of just transition for both human and non-humans. And I'd like to just say quickly that uh, I suppose working as an artist educator with Creative Rathang and Mehel, we encourage children and their parents to come out, to get out on the narrow gauge railway lines with us and to reimagine this place. The children get involved in notebook drawing games and they make thinking drawings about this land shaped by milk peat piles and remnants of sphagnum bogs. Long before bogs were identified as carbon sinks, the absorbent healing qualities of sphagnum were known to those who lived by them. Moving indoors to lab studio space, these children sometimes use magnifiers to see beyond the eye and reimagine this minuscule universe in paint. A child recently asked me, if sphagnum healed wounds during World War I, could it heal coronavirus? So I think that's a, that's a question that, that will, will trouble us all. Thank you so much, Monica and Patrick. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, way for us to then uh, go to the next part of, of our launch in which I'd like to invite Lucina Russell uh, to, uh, to give us a short reflection. Um, and before she does that, just to also let people know that if you go to the Creative Rathang and Mithal page, um, they are running a series of online discussions and, and book readings and conversations uh, with guests and the community. Um, so just look them up on the Facebook and we'll have a second book lunch with them as part of their layer series on December 5th. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll put more information about that on the webpage. Um, so thank you again to the, the four artists and um, academics for introducing to us some of the different ways in which Irish gardens, forest fields, and bogs are so important. And I'd like to invite the arts um, officer, curator, educator, and artist, Lucina Russell, who wrote a lovely introduction to our book to, to just say a few words as well. Lucina? Thank you, Karen. And thanks to everybody for the cont contributions to date. Um, I'd just like to start, first of all, by just mentioning uh, the Dublin Art Book Fair and Temple Bar Galleries. And it's just um, so fantastic and appropriate that uh, Earth Writings is part of uh, that exhibition this year. And I might just mention um, 
just two other local publications, local in terms of Kildare. I know we're going global uh, for the um, launch here tonight, but Lisa Freeman, um, Green Skies, A Double Rhythm, which is a project, uh, a visual arts project as well, um, based on the stories of the Wren women uh, on the Curra. And this is um, um, sex workers who worked uh, on the Curra camp and they very much were of the earth. They lived under forest bushes um, on the Curra camp. Um, so that's one project that's or one publication that's in, in the Dublin Art Fair. And also Martina O'Brien every single morning, which at uh, this time last year, um, we launched with the geography department in, in Maynooth and Temple Bar Galleries as well. Um, so I think we're uh, punching above our weight this year in terms of representation and I'm delighted on, about that. Uh, but just a, for, uh, a, a short reflection on tonight, I suppose two thoughts came to mind. Causing trouble and taking care. Um, and where has this project brought us? Um, and so I think it's brought us into a delicious garden of academics and artists which is a very fertile ground. To cause trouble, I suppose we've had artists and academics acting as politician, promoter, activist, audience developer, and confidant, and also at times curator, maybe as custodian. And I sometimes would feel my role uh, in relation to that um, as a funder of projects and sometimes uh, the person who doesn't fund projects, uh, like who, who decides, um, and I, I take a big um, feel, I suppose I feel a great sense of responsibility in that. Uh, but I suppose individually, the artist mightn't set out to do all of that. But I suppose by the nature of what they've, they've taken on, looking at art crisis, sometimes in a very, maybe they might see it as in a modest way, but collectively uh, tonight, even here in the presentations already, I think it's been very powerful, uh, their contribution to that. So the taking care element of it, um, and I suppose curator is a word that's used a lot. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, it's custodian, as in who gets into the museum to see the exhibits and stays quiet. That might be the traditional view, but obviously we all have a much broader uh, understanding of that word now. And I think it means taking care of each other, taking care of earth, um, developing fields of care. Um, and I think there's great potential um, for all of the artists here for great influence. Um, and that we can influence um, earth crisis, I think, uh, through education, I think offering alternative ideas, uh, creative thinking. Um, and I think the role of academic and artists can do a lot to that. I think this particular project, and I really want to congratulate Karen on all her work, um, it all looks so, when everything runs so well and it's produced so beautifully, but to really credit Karen and all of her work, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you, Karen, over the last number of years. It seems a long time ago since we met first, and I know we did talk about Monica de Bat's work, and we talked about bogs and um, roof uh, bogs and all sorts of experiments. Um, but I do think the role of citizen artists was very uh, firmly um, positioned here tonight in terms of the potential of the arts and academics to uh, really add to the debate and um, to and action, I suppose, around the, uh, the, the crisis on earth. So that's me. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Lucina. And um, at this stage, I would um, like to ask actually if uh, all of our participants don't mind turning on their videos. I'm just trying to do that myself. Um, we are, uh, sorry, I missed Lucina's slide, um, but we are done then with the slide. So we have an opportunity uh, to have some conversation amongst the artists and academics, but also to take a few questions from the floor. Um, and so let me just stop sharing. And um, I am going to do that now. And uh, it's really great to see everybody here. Um, thank you so much for your great presentations. We have a couple of questions on the floor. Um, uh, Nessa, did you want to uh, start with those first? Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Karen. Um, so first thing, there was a, a thank you came in from Blaheen Quinn. Um, Blaheen is an architect and an artist who has worked with us before, and particularly with Karen and Jerry as well in Dublin. So thanks very much, Blaheen. Lovely to hear from you. Um, and we had a question that came in from Evan Short as well from the Grory in Burr County Offaly. Um, as a question for uh, for everybody here on the panel this evening, um, how can like in a, in the 
the COVID context now um, and thinking about different platforms, whether it's Zoom or whether it's, you know, virtual platforms, um, how can a cooperative model now facilitate artists and communities to engage with issues of climate action and climate change within their own local landscapes? Um, so would anybody like to maybe uh, give a response to, to Evan's question? Any thoughts on that? Well, maybe I just find from the creative Rathangan perspective that we have pulled together many different disciplines and it has been great connecting with academics like Karen and Jerry and their, and their students and they have been out on the bog as well. So I think it's really important bringing uh, different expertise and interests together. You know, mm -hmm. we find even though um, it is terrible not to be able to meet face to face with people, but we're actually finding the online events are bringing people like this one from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it also allows us to have speakers from all over the world. So our, our next one, we're having Matthias Schuten, who has, was very involved with the Bogs years and years ago as a young Dutch student. And now he's a professor emeritus, but he's, he's really, really uh, quite political as well. So he's going to be speaking at our, at our, at our next seminar. And, um, which would be around just transition. So I suppose, given that you're from the Midlands, the whole area of the bogs and just transition are really, really important. So I just think the mehel, that trying to get people to work together is the best way. And also involved, involved with the schools. Mm. And I think that's a really good point, Monica. I think it speaks to as well, you know, that people yearn for a connection and whether that connection ideally is in person or if it's a connection like what we're doing now, um, it speaks to, I think, the quality of the relationships that are there too as well with that. Uh, yeah, I was going to just mention briefly that part of Shadim's hard graft project included some community mappings um, and called plots as part of mapping green uh, Dublin. And I was going to ask her to talk yeah, about Yeah, that's that. actually what I was going to um, mention. Um, because this, um, I've been working, um, hard graft has kind of moved on to a larger mapping of green space within the Dublin 8 um, area. So myself and Common Ground, <coughs> sorry, we got EPA funding to um, work with UCD Geography to um, build um, awareness around um, tree planting, um, and, but also green spaces within um, their, with localities. And the COVID moment actually um, ended up um, being a, a moment of potential for greening because people started to kind of realize because we needed to get outdoors and we were all stuck in our two kilometer and five kilometer radiuses, how important um, public um, greening is. Um, and what happened with us is that we've got um, a greening forum that collectively are working online and meeting and people are bringing ideas and creating community um, actions and um, activism for planting projects within um, their areas. So there is this potential um, within kind of this moment and this kind of awareness to um, build um, and plant and appreciate um, ways, the ways things could be kind of use this act, um, this moment of imagination. Thank you so much, Shodin. Um, would anybody else like to respond to the, the question from Evan? Yeah, actually, if I could direct uh... Uh, partly the a question related to Evan's question that Estelle Levin Nally has asked about the decade of restoration and the Trillion Trees campaign, Kathy. Um, you have been talking um, to uh, international and national green parties and also been trying to promote um, the understanding of the Earth Charter or Charter um, through your collaborations and eco-literacy projects as well. Um, I was wondering if you might kind of think about Estelle's question about restoration and uh, heritage rec recovery uh, well, as part of your practice. Thanks, Karen. I was delighted, Estelle, to see your question. I'm involved with the Small Whitman Project, the smallest raised bog in the southeast, the Drummond Bog Project. And I I've already highlighted to um, the artists that I'm working with, um, that we are going to be, I suppose, hearing a lot more about this UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. And the leaders for that are going to be children. So we need to, um, I suppose, become eco-literate as uh, artists who may work in schools um, and, and become a lot more familiar with the Earth Charter. The Earth Charter has been around since 2000. 
Uh, it, it came on the back of the, the Rio summit a uh, long, long time ago. And it actually, I suppose, is some of the principles that have gone into the International Green Party. So I, and just briefly, it means bringing environmental and social values together. And because we're in the business and, and the creative sector of reflecting and helping society reflect on values, envision new ones, thinking about more sort of expansive values, the Earth Charter is fundamental. I actually see the Earth Charter as something for the whole of the sector and the policy area. Um, but it's, it sort of has, um, I think there has been a rush um, and a, a great panic that we need to get on it and take action. And I think the sustainable development goals have been rolled out first. But in fact, we need to think about our values to get everybody on board. So I could go on about this. I'm very passionate about that. I'm a signatory, but I just like to let people know that Ireland isn't a signatory country to the Earth Charter. New Zealand is, many other countries are. And I was quite, uh, quite shocked, but I think it's, uh, we can join and become signatories individually from our universities, um, for our sectors and for our country. So please you know, sign up and do that. Um, and it, I think the, the idea of, of focusing on our young people is gonna be so, so vital. Um, I think Jerry was going to maybe chime in with that as well, Jerry. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say that, that there are um, you know, multiple uh, ways that, that, that woods are, use, are, are valuable and, and we need to untangle them a little bit because I, I can see a situation where, for example, carbon sequestration uh, as, a, uh, as a broad goal could lead to very uh, uh, bland reforesting of, of a certain kind uh, to meet certain targets. Uh, I can also see how carbon sequestration through building materials might lead to a different sort of uh, reforestation than, than, than the, the sequestration of standing woods, as it were. And I can also see how restoration in a kind of um, um, sort of almost romantic historical sense could lead to a different kind of, of, of rewooding where you say, well, these are the, you know, the ect Irish trees and we're going to have more of those and, and fewer of those um, um, uh, um, invasive, invasive species. So what it means to, to restore woodlands, I think it, it meets, meets multiple agendas. And I think there really is a, um, a, an interesting ground here for um, scientific and, and artistic and political and historical uh, conversations to, to, to cross each other and, and produce a, a nuanced response rather than um, um, you know, restoration as, as, as a single process that, that everybody immediately knows what it's about. Mm. Yeah. Um, did you want to... Oh yeah, sorry, Karen. No, I, unless, unless somebody else has another comment about the discussion of, of forest and trees, I, I was wondering if it was okay to shift to ask maybe Pauline a, a question um, as she's in uh, County Kilkenny and she's surrounded by different kinds of agricultural and other fields. And, um, and there's also more nuanced discussion that is needed to think about uh, ways forward in terms of thinking differently about our relationships to our communities. Um, Pauline, did you have something that you wanted to, to add in general about, about um, this idea of a post-rural Irish field? Um, uh, I suppose where I live, predominantly is like a little microclimate in itself because it's 900 feet up a hill. So it has this um, independence, uh, unruly um, self-governance. Um, but what has come uh, very visible of recently was that most people are walking in the local forest, some might call it. It's a quilshire plantation. Uh, so our, there is a new relationship to what is very local that was otherwise much dismissed. Um, the local army um, do combat training in this particular plantation. And it's quite scary if you come across them in the dark, walking your dogs. Um, uh, so, so it's varied. It's, it's, uh, I think when you think of restoration, as Jerry noted, uh, it's looking back with rose tinted glasses um, and 
back to where? What is the point of, of origin or, or what was original in the first place? So uh, while I can speak within arm's reach, I think it's a question of representation. So um, that's why I take an autoethnography because who am I representing? Because my local, I don't know, you wouldn't call it constituency, but my local region, it's so varied. Um, people commute and I think ultimately if it was concentrated it would be a dormitory town but it's very spread out. So I think rural Ireland post Celtic Tiger has um, a melange, a big mix of um, habitations, be it you know human habitations, people commute, people uh, reside in places um, fed and led by uh, economics of building cheaply in particular zones. Um, but this new uh, observation of, of the local being a cherished one um, with the walking in the local plantation uh, is quite significant, I think, for me. I mean, it's like a highway. There are so many people there. Um, uh, and, and that's quite a shift. It, wouldn't, it would have been dismissed before then. Um, and people would have gone elsewhere. That's quite an Irish thing to go somewhere else uh, for leisure, you know, for a walk. It wouldn't be in uh, a Quilch forest necessarily. So I think um, the, the concentration back into the local because of restrictions in the five kilometre zone has put a different lens on how we view um, what is close to us in proximity and I think that's that's quite rich and will provide rich uh, um, ideas uh, let's say for the future too across the board across disciplines. And, and Patty did you have a couple of comments that you wanted to add to this? Um, as yeah, we'll be sure. Thanks for inviting me it's always hard to jump in when there's lots of Voices. I was going to say something about the bogs because um, and the restoration because it was only yesterday it was announced that the, the government was, I think it's 108 million uh, euros investing in this big restoration project for the, the, the cutaway bogs. So this is where they've been, uh, you know, excavated for the, the industrial, you know, mining. And I, I think going back to sort of Jerry's point, um, you know, it's interesting to think it, partly that the argument is that this is going to be for, for carbon sequestration and carbon storage. But uh, to go back to this, the sphagnum moss, you know, to make these destroyed sort of scoured landscapes and environments uh, able to sequester carbon, the sphagnum needs to be growing there because it's, the, it's the, the moss that does that sequestering. It's not just a wet uh, industrial bog. And that has not been proven to be able to be done easily. I mean, there's efforts to, to, to preserve the remnants of raised bog, which haven't been fully destroyed. And that's kind of, you know, working to some extent. But the idea of being able to, you know, bring back the moss and, and restore it so that it can sequester the carbon is, is, is very, I mean, it's unlikely. Uh, and the other thing I'd say about that is about the carbon storage. The other word that's used is carbon sink. And even though that's a positive thing within the kind of accountancy of emissions, I mean, a sink is where waste is put, you know, uh, and there's definitely something else which we'd have to be aware of or thinking about is that the, the bogs are these, you know, have historically been these wastelands and to then, you know, re restore them as sinks, as, 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 as places where, you know, pollution from elsewhere can kind of be kept. Again, there's, there's things that, you know, were worth questioning and, 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 and thinking about. Um, so it, it's just to make the point that restoration is a very contested uh, uh, and, and um, sort of a problematic term. Yeah. Um, and and Nessa, um, did, you, did you have something to comment upon? Because one of the other aspects of our walks is that uh, we had a lovely uh, exploration with Burr and Bo Trust uh, and, um, and, and different artists and, and farmers in the Burr and, and they practice transhumans and it's completely different. Um, and, and they had a very different set of, of, of ideas and, and it gets back to these, these much more nuanced place-based approaches to understanding collaborations mm -hmm. rather than a kind of catch-all uh, approach. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it brings up um, something I might maybe throw over to Shodin in a moment as well, too, is um, this idea of uh, the transference of knowledge and also the, 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 the kind of not just as a transgenerational thing, um, but also how new communities can contribute to that as well. So it's not just that there can this there can be this insider outsider idea of landscape in Ireland, unless you're from the place you, you won't really know it. Um, but I think the value of Burn Bio is exactly what Jerry was saying as well about the value of bringing different kinds of communities of knowledge together, different kinds of practices together. Um, so one of the examples we, we heard from um, from Brendan there and others as well was, you know, younger farmers who are now, you know, maybe working full time, farming part time and trying to make a living um, are thinking of new ways of living sustainably um, on the landscape, but also then using the, the knowledge that they've inherited from their family as well which is really important so it's kind of a mix of what we would call like traditional ecological knowledge um, and also kind of understanding the importance of community knowledge as well too that may never have been written down or it mightn't be in Chagask or it mightn't be in the department of, 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 uh, of agriculture but local knowledge is really really important for that too um, so I might maybe just ask Shodin a question if we have time if that's okay Karen yeah um, um, just in terms yes. of your, yeah oh, sorry sorry to interrupt and then maybe we could also um, ask Lucina about her experience in terms of using online platforms because oh, of her yeah. experience. But, um, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so I just was just wondering, Shodin, from your own experience of both the project when you were able, able to go there in situ and able to meet people and how it is now um, in terms of the, the, kind of the kind of engagement you have with the local communities, how, how is that working at the moment? Um, I, I suppose what I wanted to just point to maybe is as someone who has um, Irish roots, um, my mom and dad are from Kerry, but I grew up in Zambia and South Africa. I think it really is important to think about um, who is community and how is community brought in because community in Ireland can qu be quite a close space. So, you know, the GAA club or the community centre. So I think that's something that attracted me to community gardens because it is um, a space where um, there's no sort of um, religious bias or um, it becomes a more open space for um, people from um, different cultures um, to come together. Um, the um, online kind of um, platform that we're working with, I mean, it's, it's difficult, COVID is difficult. We were very lucky with our project that we actually had done a lot of work on the ground. So we've done a, a large mapping, um, community mapping project um, just before restrictions had happened. So we had um, collected um, all the people who are interested in contributing to the project. So in contacting them directly, then we were um, able to kind of bring people together online um, and um, converse with people that way. So. And we, we got lucky with timing. I think it's um, starting a new project now um, is difficult, but it's always just that thing, isn't it? Of just finding out who, um, who the sort of um, people in the community are that are kind of leading um, specific campaigns and connecting with those. Mm -hmm. So I'd maybe, I'll maybe let Lucina um, speak, but there was something that kind of interested me. And I think it's as an artist, it's um, this, in Monica and, and Patrick's um, final paragraph, um, they say, um, they talk, talking to the sphagnum moss, they talk about um, this work of reme remediation and healing works on near unimaginable scales of time and space, which is why we need art to make that sensible. Not sensible in sense of appropriate, but sensible as in perceptible, thinkable, imaginable. Um, and I suppose the place of the artist um, within um, this project for me is quite important because um, for art to be seen as valuable and to be contributing um, in this moment of um, potential economic um, you know, crises, um, I think as artists, we need to hold that space, that our practices are valuable, um, our practices are important, that we bring um, imagination um, and vision um, to um, community and we do that through collaboration um, with like places like Maynooth Geography. So in this kind of interdisciplinary practice I think is incredibly 
particularly important um, when talking to climate crises. So Lisa, now I know a lot of your work has done that um, and is doing that. Okay, so Karen, did you have a specific question for me? No, I just, um, actually, Shadeen had a, a really nice transition there because I, I know that um, you're working um, it, it, with the art service, but also with um, the, you've been awarded a regional climate um, uh, kind of interdisciplinary center. And you had mentioned also the importance of citizen artists yeah. and other forms of, of, of collaboration. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just speaking about that and then also the, the question that came through um, from Eamon Short is also wondering about, you know, in the COVID landscape, then what happens when that type of, of intense collaborative uh, in-person work on the ground work, uh, sorts of uh, imagination uh, works that's quite embodied and in place shifts to the online platform and, and what your experiences have been with that. Yeah, well, first of all, maybe we might go there first because I mentioned curating and, and in the sense of taking care and something I feel very strongly about in this is taking care of artists as much as we can. And I think even to, you know, artists that worked whatever way they did pre-COVID and um, to suddenly just expect them to transform themselves into film directors and editors and, uh, you know, content creators. Like it's some people talk to it very naturally or doing it already, but a lot of people weren't. And I know a lot of people found it very stressful. Um, in early March, I know we had a whole series of grants that were awarded for a particular thing. And then very quickly we went back to people and said, can you do this online? And in some sense, I nearly felt it was an unfair ask, you know, and it did cause stress. And some people rose to the occasion. And I mean, look, a lot of us have learned a lot from it. And it's brought the work to places we wouldn't have expected to. But um, I think um, for me, it's just really important that the quality of, of work would still be maintained, you know, for artists. Um, but look, I think, as you mentioned, Kildare is going to be, um, well, it has been appointed as a CARO, that's a Climate Action Re Regional Office for 17 local authorities around Ireland. Um, so you can see that's a big responsibility, but of course I'm seeing that as a brilliant opportunity. And I just think uh, sometimes when things align that we have university in the county um a geography department that we're obviously very uh, have a, a very strong relationship with and um, so i'm really can see um that uh, that creativity and the arts will be right at the heart of what we're doing it just it just makes perfect sense really um and i think education and children will be um, a large part of it as as many of the speakers have mentioned already and um, so i think there's just great potential within that um although you know i'm sure some of it will happen online but i can't wait to get out into communities again um, and to meet people um so yeah, but I suppose we try to stay optimistic and look about about what's what's possible and um, potential within that. Um, but as, as Shodin mentioned about a lot of this is it's hard graft, isn't it? But um, I think we're certainly surrounded with people surrounded by people who are up for that challenge. Great. Thank you. I think we had one question as well, Karen, actually from um, from Dan Carey. So I think Dan is normally in the hot seat for these um, occasions. So I think he's quite, quite happy now to be sitting back and enjoying the conversation. Um, Dan's question was for everybody was um, with regards to COVID-19 and everybody now stuck within their 5K boundaries. Has that changed people's perceptions of nature um, and the people's connections to nature in particular? Um, and I think I think Pauline has touched on that already and, and a few others as well. So if anybody might like to respond to Dan's question on that. Well, I could just 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 say that um, I bet when when um, uh, city Council discusses, uh, Dublin City Council discusses its budget for next year, the number of people who will be speaking up for the parks and gardens uh, budget will be, will be much increased. Uh, I've never seen so, so such density of use of um, uh, uh, local green space um, as I have seen uh, over the last uh, few months when I've been in those, in the, in those spaces. And um, I, do, I do think, I think Pauline's right, there's a, there's a 
there's an attention to 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 um, what we can find local and um, a way of of valuing it because it's all we have to value. Whereas though I think there was a tendency before, you know, maybe to think, well, I don't want to go to any old hill. I want to go to the tallest hill, or I want to go to the the the, the biggest lake, or you know, that the, there was something. There must be a superlative example that one could one could access in 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 some way. And I wonder whether. We we become we might become more lo locally satisfiable, uh, and that might be consistent with um, um, a sort of slow living and um, uh, uh, the whole a whole new way of maybe um, uh, uh, not relying upon fossil fuels to enable us to to tick off the tallest, the highest, the oldest, and all the rest of it as part of a sort of global tourist and actually become um, people who. Um, take more care of and care more about their immediate vicinity in the in the way that perhaps farmers do, but maybe city dwellers often don't. Great, thanks, Jerry. I think Pauline wants to come in, and then maybe Kathy as well. well yeah. One uh, realization, having moved to the countryside from Kilkenny City, lived in Dublin for years, was that it's so difficult to walk in the countryside on the roads, it's, it's so dangerous. Um, that took a few years and um, for me to realize until I gave up. But there is a, a reclaiming of the roads, not the streets. So there is this new agency, you could say. And I can imagine, um, I, I read about it somewhere where there's kind of alert signs where there's pedestrians. Um, I think it's in some urban zone, but uh, I can't remember where, but, but there's definitely um, a new awareness of people walking on the roads. These are small country roads, people with young children and families. So it, not only is it becoming more familiar, I hope it continues, um, there's a certain bravery with that and a new agency with that. But um, it's in our cognizance now that we might meet a pedestrian if we're driving. And that is very local and that is very new. And it, it, it's, it's great because to feel the lie of the land, however you drive it, when you're walking it, you notice different things and you begin to appreciate the kind of minutiae of what's around you and you have a new sense of community as it were not just social but you know in your habitat and inter interspecies as well and um, and i would notice that being snowed in and um, where all the wildlife come out and you can see evidence of it in the winter necessarily more so but but definitely there's a new agency there and i think that's a very positive thing that has come about thanks so much um pauline i think that um kathy do you have something really short but we realize we've gone over a little bit so we want to just wrap yeah. it up for our viewers i'm i'm very privileged to live in a woodland so i haven't noticed much difference and i live in a very rural area with not much traffic but I would say having lived on this land with, with this forest community, that's where the care comes from and that's where the love comes from. And before you know it, you stand up to fight and to save it. And that's, that's what got me uh, to stand up in the National Convention for the Green Party. I wanted to preserve this permanent forest in the future, but forests everywhere. So, um, and I was directing it back to my father's involvement with the Vietnam War and how forests were, you know, so poisoned overseas and that's still a pollution and atrocity that's affecting so many in different parts of the world. And there is a term for that and I just, uh, the philosopher in Australia, Glenn Albert, calls that solophilia when we actually start to love and stand up for places. And also um, Yifu Tuan, who's going to be celebrating his 90th birthday um, very soon. Um, has a book called Topophilia, a classic book that many of us uh, tend to still go back to. And uh, he was my PhD supervisor. So uh, through the, the hellos to Ifu, I think we can see <laughs> that Earth Writings um, owes to a lot of these different kind of conversations. Um, and the idea of starting at home, starting where you are, and also thinking about communities as, as inclusive uh, possible places for people. Um, I just wanted to um, thank all of our fabulous participants and contributors. Um, thank you also to the audience for being here and uh, hopefully we'll be posting 
this up uh, so you can tell your friends how great it was and tell them to have a look on our podcast for the earthwritings.ie webpage. And um, we'd like to again thank our, our great sponsors and funders. And thank you also for some of the, the questions. Um, uh, Roisin and Eamon will try to be in touch with you, but this idea of place-based is the same as people-based, I think. Uh, the idea of places, we are placelings, as Edward Casey would describe. We're always embodied, we're always in place, and we're always in environments. And so we need to become more aware of our multi-species realities and this idea that Haraway talks about as a thick present. And I do believe that what Shodin was talking about is that we can really learn very much from artists in terms of awakening, in terms of imaginations, and in terms of actually realizing and being empowered to act, as Kathy was saying, realizing uh, more healthy and inclusive environments for us um, and for future generations. Um, Nessa, did you want to say a final thank you uh, from the Moore Institute? And uh, thank you again, everybody. Yeah, and just to say, um, just say, just to say thank you again um, for everybody for joining us here. It's always a pleasure. Um, we had originally hoped we would do maybe two or three um, legs of a journey. Often, Karen and Jerry and I and others, we would go to Dublin, we would go to Maynooth and, and invite you all to Galway. So I just want to say uh, thank you all very much for joining us this evening and uh, to Dan and to David again for facilitating the conversation tonight. It's the beginning, it's the continuation of one of one conversation, but I think it's, the, it's going to be the beginning of other kinds of conversations in many other ways as well. So, Garmili Mahagi Pilar.